Physics and chemistry consist of things you can test right now in present time uh, and observe. They're testable, observable, repeatable. Speculations about what happened millions of years ago are not testable, uh, repeatable, improvable, or subject to disproof. So Darwin's theory is not at all like physics and chemistry. It is a completely different, um, it's an ideology. It is not a science. Episode of the Sharpie Report. I'm your host Sam Johnston. We're found on YouTube, iTunes, Block Talk, Spreaker Radio, and you can follow me at Twitter at Sam T Johnston. Well, today we are diving into the world of science, and we're going to be talking about a theory, and I stress the word theory, that has been propagated and researched and discussed and taught for nearly 200 years, but there seems to be some lacking evidence for it, and we are just trying to find the truth of what's actually going on. And joining me to talk about the theory of evolution is James Perloff. He is the author of Truth is a Lonely War Truth is a Lonely Warrior, where he exposes a lot of what's going on with the New World Order and a tornado in a junkyard, which specifically talks about Darwinism and the theory of evolution. So without further ado, Mr. Perloff, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good, especially being back on the shopping report. Thanks for having me on for a second time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got a lot of great feedback from our first conversation, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm excited to talk about this um, this topic. And before we go too much further, I just want to let everyone know in the audience, this is not going to be a discussion where we say, "Hey, the the Bible says that evolution is not real," so that's the end of it. No, we're going to talk about real scientific facts and real scientific issues that we have with the theory of evolution, and, and try to grow our understanding of. One, why is it being talked about so much? Why do people teach it as fact? And then two, in the second part, talking about the actual issues scientifically of, of what's wrong with it. So starting off, why is it so important that we, we talk about Darwinism? What, what, what is the, what's the purpose here? Why are we even having this conversation? Because the New World Order, which, as you know, is, is a long-term plan that's long been continuing. Um, one of its components is a theory of evolution. And uh, it... It's very important for people to know that uh, if they're going to keep watching this broadcast, otherwise they're going to think we're just talking about biology and what's that got to do with the New World Order. And here's why the the theory of evolution, which was essentially introduced by Darwin in 1859 with his book uh, on the origin of species. Um, in the Christian worldview, you know, when, it, when a child goes to uh, Christian uh, to Christian church, reads the Bible, what does that child learn? He's taught that, right in the book of Genesis, that God created the heavens and the earth, that God created all life forms, and that God created man in his own image. But when that child goes to public school, he's now taught a completely different story. He's now taught that the Big Bang created the heavens and the earth, not God. It's a naturalistic event that happened 15 billion years ago. Somehow there was nothing, and then for some unknown naturalistic reason, nothing became everything, which, by the way, violates the laws of physics because, you know, matter cannot be created out of nothing. Energy can't be created out of nothing. Uh, also, uh, according to what you're taught in your uh, science class in a public school, um, life forms actually happen because, you know, the Earth was once this molten sphere and it cooled off and these oceans formed and they had all these chemicals in them. And eventually the chemicals arranged themselves into our first single celled ancestors, which began evolving. And that's where life forms came from. Nothing to do with God, you know, again, a chance process. And then as far as man goes, man is not created in the image of God. Man is actually created in the image of ape. We evolved from ape like creatures through tooth and claw survival of the fittest and natural selection. And so if you're a child, you know, you have a contradiction you're facing all the time. You're hearing one thing in church, one thing in the Bible, and then you're hearing something else in the, in the public school. And uh, part of the, 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 the problem for these children is that they've been taught that uh, with good reason that science is trustworthy. I mean, science has made many gains for mankind over the years. We use it all the time. And they get the idea, well, you know, if, if Darwin's theory has been scientifically proven to be a fact, then what I'm hearing in church, reading the Bible, must not be true. 
And this is one reason why after exposure to public schools or going to college, you hear again and again about students losing their faith, not going to church anymore, giving up on God. Um, now, there are uh, some people who will try to make the theory of evolution compatible with the Bible. I've heard people say, hey, what's the big problem? You know, I, I'm, I'm Christian and I believe in evolution true, too. But the uh, problem with that same is that if you really look at it, the story of creation, the story of Adam and Eve is radically different from Darwin's theory of evolving from ape-like creatures and fish before that, you know, over millions of years. It, it's not in the Bible and trying to make them compatible is really wishful thinking. Um, no, so I'll acknowledge that uh, there are many people who uh, are comfortable with both views, but for a lot of people, Darwin's theory uh, actually turns them into atheists. And I want to get into some examples. But let me throw it back to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's it's interesting um, that people try to to pair evolution and the Bible. Uh, it's almost like it's almost like they're like that's a way for Satan to introduce uh, issues with with Scripture. It's almost like you're trying to mend the world mm -hmm. and Scripture together, and it just doesn't work. It just it's not possible. Well, you're right. As a matter of fact, uh, the theory of evolution, trying to combine it with the Bible, has been used for a lot of Scripture uh, twisting. For, uh, they'll say that Adam and Eve were really eight men, and uh, six days. Of creation it wasn't really six days it was really billions of years and it's all symbolic and of course when you, once you do that once you make the bible symbolic it really loses its its force because where does it stop being symbolic it's all just you know was jesus just symbolic and maybe the res res resurrection was just symbolic uh once you start taking those liberties with the scriptures um by the way i wanted to just quote someone uh julian huxley who is the there's a grandson of Thomas Huxley. Was it a son or grandson? I've forgotten now. Um, but Thomas Huxley was Darwin's chief defender in the 19th century. These guys were Freemasons, by the way. And Julian Huxley was considered the leading spokesperson for evolution in the 20th century. And he said this, quote, Darwinism removed the whole idea of God as the creator of organisms from the sphere of rational discussion, uh, end quote. So Julian Huxley was really saying, you're not even rational if you believe in God after being exposed to Darwin. And, um, you know, a lot of people, as I was um, uh, mentioning, have been turned into atheists by uh, Darwinism, even though some people aren't. And I'm a perfect example. You know, when I was 12 years old and I was, I, I grew up in a sort of an agnostic home. We didn't have any religion in our home, but I wasn't really um, adversarial towards the Bible. You know, I didn't hate it or anything. But then in the sixth grade, um, my teacher, Mr. Horowitz, was teaching us evolution and had a Christian classmate who raised her hand and said, well, that's not what the Bible teaches. And he looked at this little girl with almost with pity in his eyes. He said, I'm sorry, dear, but science has proven that the Bible is wrong. And my, my classmates uh, chimed in and they said, yeah, the Bible's wrong. You know, it's, it's a bunch of malarkey. And so I said, oh, to myself at that moment, I said, oh, so that all that stuff about Adam and Eve that's just an uh, old myth, you know, Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus type of myth, you know. Um, and I didn't know it, but this very important step in my own development, uh, I know I was an atheist for a number of years, this is my first step towards becoming an atheist when I was told that the Bible was all wrong and just an old myth. And uh, actually, there are some pretty famous people who have been turned into atheists. Um, I, I like to use some examples just so people won't think I'm just speaking, in, in, you know, subjectively from my own experience. Um, E.O. Wilson, famous biologist at Harvard, said this, quote, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolutionary theory, end quote. Now, another famous guy is Andrew Carnegie, uh, the famous industrialist. He became an atheist, and here's what he wrote in his own autobiography published in Boston in 1920. He said, uh, quote, when I, along with three or four of my boon companions, was in this state of doubt about theology, including the supernatural element, and indeed the whole scheme of salvation, I came fortunately upon Darwin's works. I remember that, lud that light came as a flood, and all was clear. Not only had I got rid of theology and the supernatural, but I found the truth of evolution, end quote. Andrew Carnegie. And I'll give you one more, another very famous person, Joseph Stalin. Now, this is from the official biography of Stalin. 
published in Moscow, the Soviet Union, um, Landmarks in the Life of Stalin. You know, this is a guy who killed millions of people, literally. Uh, here's what it says in his official biography, Soviet biography, quote, at a very early age, while still a pupil in the ecclesiastical religious school, Comrade Stalin developed a critical mind and revolutionary sentiments. He began to read Darwin and became an atheist. Jigler Jidzi, a boyhood friend of Stalin's, relates, I began to speak of God. Joseph heard me out and after a moment, silence said, you know, they are fooling us. There is no God. I was astonished at these words. I'd never heard anything like it before. How can you say such things? So, so, I exclaimed, I will lend you a book to read. It will show you that the world and all living things are quite different from what you imagine. And all this talk about God is sheer nonsense, Joseph said. What book is that? I inquired. Darwin, you must read it. Joseph impressed on me. End quote. Landmarks in the life of Stalin. So, uh, as you can see, Sam, uh, and we gave a lot more examples, but a lot of people have been turned into atheists as uh, a result of being exposed to Darwin's theory of evolution. Very powerful uh, theory through, uh, as, as we're going to see very shortly, um, a lot of sleight of hand, uh, a lot of um, tricky logic uh, that doesn't hold up when, when, when actually put in the light of um, logical, critical thinking and scrutiny. But uh, it has had a serious impact on our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's one huge uh, thing you notice from, especially someone from like Stalin, is if if you introduce the the ideas of evolution and Darwinism and survival of the fittest, which is a huge mm -hmm. aspect of that, then you can start yes. looking at people who aren't you and who are below you as well. They're just not strong enough to survive, so they don't have the right to survive. And and right. you can see that idea trend all throughout our, our, you know, more and more of our culture now as we start to move into this this new world where we can look at anyone differently or, or even if you look at in the, the way that uh, the secret societies work and the people at the top look mm -hmm. down at everyone else and view them as nobodies, mm -hmm. it's, it's th those ideas are... are moving in our culture, moving in our society, when they're really just not, they're just based on things that just aren't true. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, very good point. Uh, you know, uh, they look at people as cattle, and once you accept the evolutionary view to point of view, man is just another animal, so why not just treat him as another animal, send him off to the slaughterhouse? And I want to mention, too, that Darwin himself, just in case people think that he was a just a naive guy who was pushing a... Um, what he honestly believed was, was true science. Darwin himself wrote this to a friend in 1873. Now he uses the, uh, the name Lyell, that's Charles Lyell, uh, who was a um, lawyer turned geologist. He came up with the idea that the uh, geological sediments were laid down over millions of years, which Darwin needed for his theory to work. It had needed millions and millions of years. Um, this is a quote from Charles Darwin, 1873, quote, Lyell is most firmly convinced that he has shaken the faith in the deluge, meaning the, the biblical flood, far more efficiently by never having said a word against the Bible than if he had acted otherwise. I have read lately Morley's Life of Voltaire, and he insists strongly that direct attacks on Christianity, even when written with the wonderful force and vigor of Voltaire, produce little permanent effect. Real good seems only to follow the slow and silent side attacks end quote, Charles Darwin. So here he himself characterizes his work as a side attack on the Bible. Now, I knew that a frontal assault on the Bible would offend Victorian people in England, right, in that, that era. People were very uh, offended if he attacked the Bible. So I said, okay, I'm not going to attack the Bible. I'm just going to give you this alternative account of creation, producing scientific facts. I won't say a word about the Bible, and people will decide all on their own to give up on the Bible. And actually, it had that effect. Yeah. Did did God really say that he created the earth? Did God really, you know, <laughs> more subtle attacks definitely are mm -hmm. uh, the way yeah. Satan works. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, as we kind of transition into talking about the science behind Darwinism and why, and the holes in it, I do have one question is, is you list off a, a, a people who, who were Christians, who, who were born again, and then they, they studied the theory of evolution and they got turned off from the biblical worldview. So to me, that's like, well, maybe... Darwinism has some some truth to it and some, you know, an, at least enough to pull people away from Scripture. So how, how do we balance that uh, with what we're talking about? Uh, well, uh, the reason people uh, get persuaded by that is the big lie, you know, uh, we know who controls the world. Um, Satan's been called the prince of this world, and we know through foundations and um, uh, control of governments that schools are uh, teaching uh, agenda rather than real education. 
And so people are constantly exposed to this. And so they they accept it as, as true. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in public school, it's like hearing one side of a court case. You know, if you went into a courtroom and you only heard the prosecutor, you'd hit, think that the guy is guilty. If you only heard the defense attorney, you'd think that he's innocent. You need to hear both sides. They don't hear both sides in school. Um, now, in terms of transitioning over, um, you know, it's very common to transition over to this, this science side of this, this issue from the social side. Um, it's very common to hear evolutionists say something like this. You know, Darwin's theory is well proven to the laws of gravity. So if you creationists don't believe in the theory of evolution, uh, you probably don't believe in physics or chemistry either because evolution is a science just like uh, chemistry and physics. So if you're against it, you're anti-science. And that's how they love to characterize us as, you know, backwoodsmen who are, you know, uh, ignorant and uh, don't understand science. Um, but as we're going to see, actually, the science is all on the side of God and it's all against Darwin's theory. Um, we're going to find out that it's very much not like phys physics and chemistry, which we do respect very much. Yeah, I, I, one quote I, I, I heard is, beware of the sound of one hand clapping, which means if someone's clapping on with one hand, there's probably another side that you need to study and mm -hmm. understand, uh, which is why we're having this episode is because, you know, if you're a Christian and you you have only studied the Bible and you've only studied scripture, you might you might run into the things of, of Darwinism and you have to be able to understand why people are saying what they're saying, the facts behind Darwinism, the, the lies that are being told, and, and the best way to refute them. It, it's important to talk about these things. So uh, one thing that you do is you talk about four major points um, that discredit Darwin's theory. So let, let's kind of start there and, and expand on them. Sure. And uh, I kind of like to start at the beginning, which mm -hmm. is the beginning of life from yep. the Darwinian perspective. So they say that life began... Um, well, actually, Darwin himself said this in on the origin of species. He said that life began what he called a warm little pond, and he talked. To, he thought cells were very simple things. You know, back in the nineteenth century, he thought the smaller you get, the simpler it gets. And he talked about the various chemicals. He proposed certain chemicals that would have come together to form the first uh, living cell. Now, eventually, evolutionists realizing that a warm little pond wouldn't survive long enough for a significant evolution to occur in, change it to the ocean. And that's why you hear them talk about the ocean now. And they say that the oceans were filled with all these chemicals and sunlight hit it and lightning hit it. And eventually they arranged themselves into the first living cell. Okay. So um, I, I like to use this analogy of um, uh, a cola can. This is a, a Whole Foods cola. And if you look at it, it's uh, well designed, you know, it's got a pop top on the top that it'll, it'll pop it open. It's got a barcode that scans and uh, gives you the price. And it um, says that there is um, 12 ounces in here, which it uh, uh, says it's 354 mLs and um, it has a list of all the ingredients. You can see that it's very well designed. Now, if you ask any person, even an evolutionist, if pure chance could have produced this uh, cola can, they would say, no, it's too well designed. Nobody could have, you know, they couldn't have come about by pure chance, a random assembly of chemicals. Well, uh, the fact of the matter is that cells are astronomically more complicated than that can. I'm going to give you a quote. Um, uh, here we go. Quote, a simple one-celled bacterium, R. coli, contains DNA information units that are the equivalent of 100 million pages of Encyclopedia Britannica, and, end quote, and that quote is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And if you look at cells, they're not simple as Darwin thought. Um, cells have thousands of different proteins, and these proteins are consist of a smaller building block called amino acids. There's hundreds of amino acids in one protein, and they have to be in the correct order for that protein to function. Now, Sir Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize, or for co-discovering the structure of DNA. He calculated the chances of getting one protein by chance. The odds, he said, are one in 10 to the power of 260. Now, that's such a big number that you couldn't fit that many electrons in the known universe. That's the odds against getting one protein, let alone the thousands this one-celled bacterium would need. Um, but it's, it goes beyond that, Sam. Uh, in addition to the proteins and amino acids, you need the genetic code, which runs the cell. And, you know, cells actually have a translation device that translates the genetic code. So what came first, the translating device by chance or the code by chance? Because they both had to be there to function. Also, 
cells uh, ingest nutrients uh, from their surroundings and they expel wastes. So which came first? I mean, to believe in chance uh, production of this system, you have to believe that by pure chance, both came about simultaneously. But an example that I, I, I find kind of, for me, it's most hard hitting is cellular reproduction, because, you know, uh, that's a very complicated process. But if you think about it, uh, you know, cells can't, they need a process of cellular reproduction to make the next cell. So to believe in Darwin's theory, you have to believe in the, the span of just one lifetime, a cell completely developed the entire process of cellular reproduction in one lifetime. Because if it didn't, if it died before that happened, it, it, there, there never would have been a second cell and the entire evolutionary process would stop right there. So you see that mathematically, this idea of cells forming by chance, it's ridiculous. The other thing I want to stress is that science is supposed to be based on observation, right? Good objective observation. Do we have any observations to support this theory? Do we, have we ever seen a cell come about by chance? Have ever seen any part of a cell come about by the random recombination of chemicals, just random floating together? It's never happened. It's never been observed. It's mathematically absurd. And yet it is taught as fact. Um in our public schools and students accept it because they don't hear any challenge to it. Yeah, there was even a study back in the 50s, I think, where scientists tried to use all the elements that were around, or at least we think was around at the creation of our Earth and tried to reignite uh, forming cells out of nothing, and he just wasn't able to do it. Eventually was, you know, kind of abandoned because it, he couldn't do anything like that. And, um, it, you know, and even going further is Darwin thought that what, what Darwin thought cells were, it would be like, it, like if you picture a Buick now, and that's what Darwin thought a cell was, it's like a galaxy today, t t based on our understanding. There's just so much more. Mm. He thought that uh, small meant simple, but it's just not the it's just not the case. It's so complicated that, it, like you said, it's impossible to um, to have one piece start at a time. You have to have everything come together at the perfect moment. Right. And uh, speaking of small, our own technology backs that up, and you, know, you can have a uh, you know, a flash drive and it's got in an incredible amount of information on it, even though it's very small. And you can see that uh, there's a par some sort of parallel to what God did in making things very intelligent and ver uh, with a lot of information packed into a very tiny thing, mm -hmm. which was, of course, not understandable to Darwin. DNA had not yet been discovered in his day. Mm -hmm. yes. But they still, they still sell the theory yeah. that, he, that he sold. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of the the issue of the beginning of life is really complicated but there's another aspect of uh evolution uh it, it's talking about the mutations and and genetics really talking about how things have changed over time and you've you've written on the problem with genetics and its involvement with evolution right and uh darwin you know darwin thought that animals had this flexible capacity to adapt to their environment and um um uh, speaking of uh, natural selection, he said, uh, quote, by this process long continued, it seems to me almost certain that an ordinary hoofed quadruped, meaning a four-footed creature, might be converted into a giraffe, end quote. And though he thought you could take a donkey, you put it in the right environment like Africa, it could change into a giraffe. The problem is uh, giraffe genes and donkey genes aren't the same, and putting it in Africa is not going to give the donkey giraffe genes. He didn't know about genes at the time. Uh, but, you know, genes dictate our physical makeup, um, the way we look, uh, our, uh, uh, our biology is dictated by our genes. And, uh, you know, uh, kangaroos only give birth to kangaroos because they only have kangaroo genes. They can't give uh, uh, birth to um, uh, another type of creature. So um, uh, when they first heard about genetics, Darwinists resisted that because they really it was a, it was a stumbling block for them because they were saying, well, man came from fish, but fish's genes were radically different than human genes. And they couldn't figure out how, how the fish got the genes to become a human being. And so this, the solution they stumbled on was mutations, because after a while, it's found that uh, mutations occur. We all know that, you know, if you go to get an X-ray, you get a lead apron to protect you because, you know, the, the radiation might mutate your genes. Um, the uh, Darwinian uh, theory is that random mutations occurred uh, due to environmental influences or just copying mistakes in the genetic code. A mutation would occur, which is a change in genetic information. So a Darwinist will, will say, well, how did a fish become a walking creature? They'll say, well, hundreds of millions of years ago, some fish got, by pure chance, a mutation. 
and this gave its fin, uh, you know, a little turned a little bit into an arm or a leg. And this was so pro-survival that it was adopted by the rest of the fish in that population, and it became spread through the whole population of fish. And then, lo and behold, another random mutation occurred that gave the fish a little bit more of a leg. And this occurred so on and so forth until finally the, the fish, had a, uh, its fins had completely converted by random mutation into natural selection into legs. And this process of mutation and uh, natural selection occurred until the, the fish actually became human beings. And that's their basic explanation. But um, that theory doesn't hold up anymore. Now, a really um, critical book in the intelligent design movement is this one. It's called Not By Chance by Dr. Lee Spetner, graduate of MIT. Um, I don't know if I held that up correctly, but um, he, um, he taught information theory for uh, many years at the Wiseman Institute in Johns Hopkins University. And here's what he writes in his book. Quote, in all the reading I've done in life sciences literature, I've never found a mutation that added information, all point mutations, which is the most basic type of mutation in the genetic code, that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce genetic information and not increase it, end quote, Dr. Spetner. Now, that actually uh, tallies very well with what we can see. What do mutations cause in human beings? Sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, hemophilia, and about 4,000 other diseases. They actually damage human beings. They're not uh, building them up, these random mutations. A copy mistaken uh, the genetic code is like a typographical error in a book. Rarely does the typographical error improve the information. Usually it degrades it. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, I should mention that, uh, oh, you know what? Um, just to backtrack for a minute, I, I meant to do this earlier. Um, I meant to review a little bit about what the theory of evolution says. Um, what, what the theory of evolution says is we started out as uh, microorganisms, as we we're saying, one single-celled creatures, which began to evolve with the multicellular creatures. And they evolved to the first invertebrates, which are creatures that uh, have no backbone in the ocean like a jellyfish. And then the invertebrates evolved into fish. Then fish evolved into um, amphibians, which are creatures that go on land or water like a frog. And amphibians evolved into reptiles, reptiles into mammals, and mammals into ape-like creatures who evolved into men. That's, that's the theory in a, in, in a nutshell. Um, uh, but if you um, uh, look at... Uh, at mutations, they cause deg degradation. They don't cause us to advance uh, in, the, in this march of evolution that, that, that Darwin talked about. And that's, that's the same sequence that is, uh, is held up today. Um, some evolutionists will talk about, um, and I'm sorry for that uh, backtrack there, there's something that I had meant to do at the very start of talking about evolution with just a refresher on what evolution says. Um, evolutionists will sometimes talk about uh, random mutations that are beneficial. And um, there are some uh, mutations that has a, have a benefit. And one I've, I've been given more than once on radio by evolutionists is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia, as you know, is a disease. It's caused by a mutation. And it's caused by a mutation in the uh, hemoglobin protein. Hemoglobin is the part of our blood that transports oxygen. Very important. Now, um, the uh, mutation that causes uh, uh sickle cell anemia, you might say, well, how is that considered evolution because that's a disease? Well, evolutionists will say uh, people with sickle cell anemia don't get malaria. So there's a benefit to it, right? They don't get malaria. So that's a, an example of mutation that has a benefit. But if you actually take a look at it, if you look at um, a normal uh, red blood cell and then um, a uh, sickle cell, hmm. see the normal red blood cell is uh, uh, unlike the uh, sickle cell, is uh, has, has a, a lovely shape to it. The sickle cell is deformed, and the sickle cell actually clogs your arteries. It causes great pain. And um, I'm a registered nurse, by the way. I used to work with sickle cell patients back in the 70s. They would die at that time before better technology came around. They would die in their 20s from this uh, disease. You know, sickle cells do not transport oxygen as well as normal red blood cells. They have lost function as a result of mutation. Uh, the tra truth is that the parasites that cause malaria, they don't like to go into these deformed cells, you know, like you don't want to move into a house that's all dilapidated and broken down. But that is not evolution. It's it's um, degradation of function. And that's what these random mutations cause, these copying mistakes cause. They don't build up anything. They cause it to um, to go downhill. 
Have you uh, have you ever had the opportunity to ask someone who believes in evolution how their theory interacts with the theory of entropy? You know, the fact that when things are left to its own being, they usually degrade instead of, you know, build up and improve. Have you ever had that conversation? Um, well, I've certainly studied it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the second law of thermodynamics, which says that um, something left uh, by itself will degrade. So if you leave a car in a garage for years and years and years, after a while, it'll start to rust. It will, the, the, the tires, rubber will start to degrade. It won't build up, though, into a better car. It, it will degrade over time. And, um, you know, uh, that is one of the chief arguments, actually, from uh, the standpoint of physics against the, uh, the theory of evolution is that the things tend towards greater randomity when left to themselves. Now, people do uh, from a fetus grow into a human being, but that's because we're coded to do so by our genetic code, and that is intelligently designed. Just like our computers can function they, uh, and, and, uh, and carry out things because they're designed with the computer codes, but that's the result of an intelligent designer, a computer um, uh, software designer. Uh, but when you just leave an object by itself, it'll rot, it'll decay. And so chemicals will not uh, build themselves up according to the laws of uh, entropy, according to the second law of thermodynamics, if left uh, to their own account. Yeah, my computer definitely suffers from entropy. It almost always breaks down. It's yeah, well, you know, I made that joke in PowerPoint sometimes, you know, uh, that sometimes people will say uh, when their computer uh, uh, glitches, say, damn it. Bill Gates must have designed the windows by chance, but uh, we all know that that really didn't, it didn't really work that way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so we, we kind of touched on this a little bit already, but another a point against Darwin's theory is, is irreducible um, complexity uh, and how that idea really mm-hmm. stops this theory in, in its tracks. So can you explain, explain what that is? Yeah, sure. Um, that was actually developed, that concept of, Irreducible Complexity by Michael Behe Mm -hmm. in his book, Darwin's Black Box. He is, by the way, a biochemist at Lehigh University. Um, So he's, you know, he's an intelligent guy, knows what he's talking about. And what he means by irreducible complexity is that there are certain systems in human beings and other creatures, uh, other living organisms that are very complex and they consist of many interdependent parts. Now, if you take away uh, a couple of these interdependent parts, parts, the whole system falls apart, doesn't work anymore. So his his uh, observation is that, therefore, it cannot have been built up step by step. Now, what I just said is uh, still kind of an abstract. So uh, let's take a specific example that Behe gives, which is the blood clotting system. Now, when we get a cut and, on our finger, um, a blood clot will stop the bleeding. Uh, and to our naked eye, you know, a, a blood clot might look simple, but if you put it under a microscope, there's well over a dozen steps taking place. And uh, this is a, just a little uh, graphic of the steps. And I circled uh, the one called factor eight because if a person is missing factor eight, they have a disease called, which is caused by mutation, by the way. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, uh, uh, it's called hemophilia. They're at high risk for bleeding. You know, the, one of the czars, the czar's son had hemophilia, you might recall. Um, so he had to be treated very delicately. Now, if a person was missing two or three clotting factors, they would definitely bleed to death. There's no way you could survive. So what's the problem for evolution? The problem for them is in the Darwinian model, the process of, of uh, blood clotting would have developed over millions of years as random mutations introduce each step. We see, Sam, that doesn't work because if you've got three steps, you'll bleed to death, six steps, you'll bleed to death, nine steps, you'll bleed to death. You basically have to have the whole system there in place. So B's point is, you know, there's no way the system could have evolved. It had to be there in place from the very beginning. And so the only way to explain that is there must have been a designer. And he goes on to show the same thing for human vision and the immune system, human vision, you know, you need a lot of parts. So the lens shines light onto your retina, but to communicate that image to your brain, you need the optic nerve. Okay, so what came first, the optic nerve or the retina? Well, you've got to believe they both randomly uh, occurred by chance uh, of this uh, with Darwin's model to work or the immune system. You've, you've got these antibodies which attach themselves to bacteria and they notify through a complex process the white blood cells, the killer cells, which come and destroy the bacteria. Well, what came first? Was it the antibodies or the white blood cells? Because neither one can function without the other. And so B, he says, well, obviously, um, they couldn't have both evolved totally by chance. 
uh, at the same time. So the immune system was obviously there. Uh, it was created by God. But at the beginning, if it evolved by chance over millions of years, creatures would have been wiped out by disease as the process slowly evolved. So it doesn't work. Darwin's model doesn't work. And that's the point he's making with this idea of irreducible complexity. Hmm. Man, that's... Uh... That's a hard leap to get over. When you when you interact with people and discuss these things with people who support evolution, do they have anything to refute that point? I mean, what do they say to that? Do they just ignore it? Well, they will speculate that, um, for example, blood clotting must have been functional in various lower phases where there were fewer of these components, but they have no proof to back that up. Um, that's just speculation. Um, so... Uh, you know, when you're committed to an idea, and I've been committed to ideas that I later had to admit were wrong, you know, when you're really kind of emotionally committed to an idea, you'll try to rationalize it. And that's pretty much what uh, Darwinism does. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of tricky arguments. You know, a, a famous example is that the monkeys that write Shakespeare, you know, yeah. uh, that actually started with Thomas Huxley, Darwin's good friend, Freemason, the, the uh, what are the, I think the grandfather of Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World. And he gave the, he said in a, a debate, he said, you know, if you gave a monkey a typewriter, just give it enough time, it'll write all the books in the British Museum. And later on, they, they admitted it, all, all the works of Shakespeare. But, you know, if you actually do the math, you see how ridiculous that argument is. Because if you have a typewriter just with 26 um, characters of the alphabet, no other characters, how long would it take the monkey to write the word evolution? The, well, to get the E would be pretty easy. It's 1 in 26. But to get the word uh, evolution, that's uh, 26 to the power of nine. It turns out it would take him more than five trillion attempts. And if he took, um, if he typed 10 letters a minute and never stopped, it would take him over a million years. Now, to get two consecutive uh, nine-letter words, such as the phrase evolution commenced, would take the monkey more than a billion times a billion years, which goes back further than the Big Bang. So if you gave him, started the Big Bang and he kept typing until now, he couldn't even get two consecutive nine letter words, let alone the works of Shakespeare, right? <laughs> when you actually put it, you scrutinize it, you see the, how ridiculous it is, but this is the kind of argument that the evolutionists will use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that's uh, that's quite an argument. I've heard that one before, and it, it's mm -hmm. kind of humorous when you break it down like that. Um, uh, the last one of your four major um, proofs that discredit Darwin's theory is the transitional um, forms. Can you talk a little about mm -hmm. what that means? Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why I uh, had that... Um, original uh, graphic. Uh, I, I want to bring it up one more time if I can find it where I put it. Okay, here it is. Okay. So it's, uh, again, they say that um, we went from the um, from a single celled organism to uh, invertebrates to a fish to amphibians to reptiles to mammals to apes to men. Okay, that's basically what they're saying. So if that's true, that had to be a lot of in-between forms. Because if you think about it, if, if a fish became a land creature, okay, and they say that the evolution say that the fins evolved into arms. Well, for the fins to evolve into arms, you need new bones. You need new muscles to support those those legs. You need new nerves to support this um, the, these uh, these walking limbs. And you actually, as a fish comes on shore, he's got to have a whole new breathing system. Now, according to them, this occurred by random mutation. So over millions of years. So countless creatures would have to live and die during this transitional form between fish and land creature, right? Uh, during the trial and error phase. Um, well, uh, actually, if you look at these creatures, uh, you'll find that uh, all uh, of these various organisms, uh, uh, microbes and, and um, invertebrates, fish and amphibians, reptiles, mammals, uh, you'll find that there's tens of thousands of species that fit into those categories. But how many transitional forms are there that are in between? And the answer is zero. There's none. And that's one reason why Carolus Linnaeus, who invented, he, he, well, I should say he pioneered taxonomy, which is uh, the science that classifies organisms. He's the first man who started using the words like uh, species and genus, right? And he was a creationist and he's, because there's no overlaps. There's no overlaps between these different forms at all. So if you ask an evolutionist what happened to all those intermediate forms over which there had to be billions of surviving in their own state until they evolved to the next form, they say they all became extinct. Well, that's a very convenient excuse. You know, you've got no evidence. So you say, well, they all became extinct. That's why we can't see them today. Um, so uh, again, zero evidence. Science is based on observation. They have no observations to back it up. I should mention, though, um, uh, in support of the theory, they will use fossil forms. 
And, um, you know, if we had um, a uh, uh, much time, we, I would show you that between every one of these forms, uh, evolution themselves admitted there's no transitional forms. Uh, the, you know, some will debate that there are. But let's just talk about the fossils for a minute, because that's they yeah. will say that the fossil forms or the transitionals are back in these ancient fossils. Uh, I'm going to quote Colin Patterson, senior paleontologist. Paleontologists are the, that's the profession that studies fossils at the British Museum. In fact, he was the director of the British Museum. He said this, quote, the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional fossils. As a paleontologist myself, I am much occupied with the philosophical problems of identifying ancestral forms in the fossil record. I'll lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. End quote, Colin Patterson, director of the British Museum of Natural History. Now, let's take uh, two famous examples of um, uh, transitional fossils used by evolutionists. One is the Piltdown Man, which we hear surrounded by uh, various uh, scientists, Sir Arthur Keith and Sir Arthur Smith Woodward and Sir uh, Grafton Elliot Smith. The Piltdown Man was um, some bones found in a, a gravel pit near Darwin's home. And the find was announced in 1912, and all those guys were called Sir. They were knighted for their work on the Piltdown Man, which is said to be man's ancestor. Here's the New York Times for uh, December the 22nd, 1912. I'm sorry that the image isn't real clear, but the headline says, Darwin theory proved true hmm. by the discovery of the, <laughs> you know, the mainstream media is always standing by ready to back up <laughs> the New World Order, you know? Yeah. Okay, so after about 40 years, and after many doctoral theses have been written on the Piltdown Man, uh, it was discovered there was a fake. It was actually an orangutan jaw. Somebody had filed down the teeth. They'd stained it to make it look old, and they planted it together from a uh, human skull from the Middle Ages. And it fooled all those guys at the British Museum, although who knows, maybe a couple of them were actually party to the to the to to this trick, which was actually intended to prove the theory of evolution, but it was a fake. Now, some people might say that, okay, a clever fake could, could uh, deceive scientists, but not a real fossil. So let's take an example of a uh, of a real fossil that fooled the scientists, and uh, this is a fossil of a coelacanth, which is found in Jurassic Rock, the age of the dinosaurs. And the uh, evolutionists looked at that; they said it was 60 million years old, and they said, "Look at those! It's, it, uh, it's legs. It's, this, this is a fish with legs. It's walking, you know." So, um, but then the problem was that somebody caught a live coelacanth off the coast of Madagascar. We've caught hundreds more <laughs> since then. And guess what? They examined it and found it's 100% fish. Those are just fins. They're not legs. And um, uh, Dr. Michael Detton, um, molecular biologist, is pointing out uh, why they make these mistakes. He, he points out that 99% of the biology of an animal is a soft anatomy, which you can't access in a fossil. So they're literally filling in 99% with their imagination and um, so even though you want to see it once in a while, see a spectacular headline like that one in the New York Times that showed you the missing link is found. Actually, there should be millions and millions of these uh, these these fossils, um, which we 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 don't find um, if Darwin's theory was true. For those transitions to take, like we we're saying, from fish to land creature, there would have to be millions and millions and millions. They're not out there, you know. Um, so, uh, again, we're missing the transitional forms, both living and fossil one more uh, nail in the coffin for Darwin's theory. We just look at this straight on logic, critical thinking. It's, it's not there. Unfortunately, these kind of challenges are not raised in the public schools. Hmm, interesting. Well, to kind of play the other side a little bit, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of books and textbooks and, and people talking about the evidence that supports Darwinism and supports the evolution. And there se the way they talk about this seems to be loads and loads of evidence. Have you taken time to discredit all of that? Or are there still some things that kind of hang you up? Uh, I don't think there's any hangers at this point. You know, um, if you uh, go to creation uh, uh, websites, I think just about everything um, they've said has been, you know, what the, the chief mistake that they make is um, uh, mistaking variations within a type of creature for um, for um, uh, evolution. I'll give you a couple examples. Yeah, but, you know, that's kind well, of talking the, about like the the Galapagos the, Islands. Is that what you mean? Probably that type uh, of thing. Well, well, uh, there could be the finches or, or the, these are a picture of different dog breeds. You know, we have a mm -hmm. lot of different dog breeds, and so they'll they'll say, well, look, um, dog breeders. Uh, 
uh, create uh, uh, have, have uh, made new breeds of dog in, over time and uh, um, uh, people who work with plants have developed new breeds of corn and uh, racehorse uh, owners have uh, mated horses and got faced faster racehorses. So they say this is change. It's evolutionary change. And if you get a little change over a little bit of time, you're going to get more change. And over unlimited time, you'll get an unlimited change. And thus we can see all these examples of change. Well, actually, if you look at the dogs, guess what? You know, they're all part of one species. They just have a rich gene pool that permits a lot of variation. Um, the point I would make is that Variation within a species is not the same thing as evolution, which says you go from a, a microbe to a um, to an invertebrate to a fish to a, a um, amphibian to a, a reptile to a mammal. In fact, there's a quote I, I wanted to give you. Uh, let me see if I can um, drum it up here. Um, you know, they say we went from a bacterium to a human being, right? Um, okay, this is a quote from Alan H. Linton. Professor Emeritus of Bacteriology uh, in uh, Britain, um, he says, quote, throughout 150 years of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another, end quote. So in other words, in the entire history of bacteriology, we've never seen one species of bacteria change to another species of bacteria. Yet evolutionists say we went from a bacterium to a human being. Again, where are the observations? Um, they simply aren't there. Now, um, to take another example of variation within a type would be the, the human race. There's over 7 billion people on Earth, and um, no two are exactly alike. I mean, you could try to argue that uh, identical twins are, but uh, no two are alike. And why is that? Because we've got a rich gene pool. Uh, nobody ever looked exactly like you um, before, exactly identical to, to, to you, Sam, but that doesn't mean you represent a new stage of evolution. It means you're a variation within a type. You're a variation within humanity. And uh, it doesn't mean it's not a proof for evolution. So what evolution is when they talk about faster racehorses, okay, you could get a, a male horse and a female horse that are pretty fast. They might have faster offspring, but they're not going to go, those offspring are not going to go a thousand miles an hour and they're not going to turn into elephants. In other words, change occurs within a species over time, mm -hmm. but it stays the same species. It, you, cats don't turn into dogs and dogs don't turn into cats. There's, a, there's change, but there's a limit to change. And I, that's the distinction uh, we make as, uh, as creationists. We understand that God made uh, creatures so that they could adapt to different conditions on earth. He made it just like we have smartphones. He made us with smart cells so that we could, we could change over time but not from one creature to another, not from a, a bacterium to a human being. Those are simply like when you have a car, you want it to be able to adapt. If you've got uh, cold weather, you've got a heater. If you've got um, um, hot weather, you've got an air conditioner. And so you've got these Norwegian forest cats that develop very long fur so they could adapt to the conditions. And God made them with cats with uh, cells that could adapt to conditions, but they'd never stop being cats. And so there is change over time. But it's limited, and you have to be able to have that 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 concept in mind. But it, it makes it all makes total sense. It, it's all compatible with God's design, but it is not compatible with Darwin's theory of these jumps from one type of animal to a completely different type. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I feel like if someone's listening to this broadcast who supported revolution, at, at their point, the the point, you know, after listening to all of those ideas and those facts and the problems with it, they're like, well. It, the, the problem they're going to come up is, well, there's so many people, so many high up people that support the idea of evolution. They can't all just be in on some conspiracy. You know, it, it, there has to be something more like all there's the lie is so there's if it is a lie, then there's so many people involved. How can more people not speak out against it? Right. And uh, I think the answer is uh, that they're not all in a conspiracy. I think there was some conspiratorial uh thinking that went on with this thing uh, was was brought before the public. But for most of these people, it's like the big lie. And, um, you know, people will believe anything if they're told uh, told it enough times. And uh, there's some, some fun examples. When I was a kid, we had a show called Candid Camera, which used to catch people uh, on camera not knowing they were being photographed and what turned out to be usually embarrassing situations. So what they did one time was they, um, they put up a sign on a city street. It said backward zone. And they had actors on the street when they got up to the sign would walk backwards and then they would film real people who, when they saw everybody else walking backwards, would turn around, no questions asked 
and would walk backwards. In other words, they believed something ridiculous simply because everybody else w was doing it. I'll give you one more example um, of, of a big lie. Um, the Philadelphia, I think it was the Phillies, yeah, the Phillies had a pitcher named Kyle Kendrick. And they got everybody in on this practical joke. They called, told Kyle Kendrick, you've been traded to Japan. His agent told him this. His manager showed him the contract. And he made him sign it. <laughs> News reporters came over with the microphones. His, his teammates were slapping in the back. Good luck in Japan. Well, it, it was a big lie. Everybody was saying it. And Kyle Kendrick bought it until they said, you've been punked, buddy. <laughs> you know, so um, evolution is like that. You know, uh, there are a lot of people, sincere people who teach uh, evolution and they have never been exposed to its deficits. Hmm. They've only been shown once, like we were saying before in the courtroom, they only heard the prosecutor's side, they never heard the defense right, or, or vice versa. And uh, so they are honestly, earnestly teaching this theory with the, idea, with the belief in mind that it's science when in fact it's not. And that actually um, brings me to another point I wanna make about this whole thing about, it's like the laws of gravity, it's like, physics and chemistry, you know, the laws of gravity can be demonstrated time and time again. You know, you, you, you just drop something and you can prove the laws of gravity. And in chemistry, there are many things which are repeatable and observable. Uh, for, uh, for example, water will boil at 100 degrees centigrade. Now, if I had a theory that water boils at 73 degrees centigrade, you could disprove that very easily. You just heat up water to 73 degrees and it won't boil. Evolution is completely different. Evolution consists of speculations about things that they believe happened millions of years ago. Now, for example, Darwin said that the reason we have so little body hair is because our ape ancestors preferred mates, you know, millions of years ago with less hair. Now, how can you put that to the test? How can you um, disprove that? You can't because you can't go into a time machine millions of years ago to see if that really happened. Physics and chemistry consists of things you can test right now in present time uh, and observe. They're testable, observable, repeatable. Speculations about what happened millions of years ago are not testable, uh, repeatable, improvable, or subject to disproof. So Darwin's theory is not at all like physics and chemistry. It is a completely different, um, it's an ideology. It is not a science. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's funny when you talk to people who say, oh, I don't believe in God, I, I'm an atheist. And the reason is because, well, you can't disprove or you can't prove God. Well, I mean, it's kind of like you're talking about the almost exact same mm. argument for mm. evolution. Um, and, you know, even to build off uh, on the, the big lie is, you know, there are people out there who have tried to step out against what the mainstream scientific community is saying, and they lose their jobs at universities. Mm. They lose all credit all of their uh, accreditations and they they just kind of get blacklisted in a lot of senses uh, a movie that i don't i haven't seen in a while i watched a little bit uh, mm -hmm. of it to prepare for this interview but the is expelled by ben right. stein uh is that a movie that you would endorse absolutely in fact i was uh asked to review that movie by the new american magazine so i definitely oh. saw it and it's a great movie he talks to richard dawkins he talks to evolutionists and he, uh, to back up what you're saying, he talks to a number of credentialed scientists who lost their jobs because they challenged evolution, uh, including a guy at the Smithsonian. So uh, I would definitely recommend the movie Expelled. I was so glad that Ben Stein took that step. And he made that movie. Got I think it was more than a thousand theaters across America screened it, which is not a, pretty kind of unusual for a politically incorrect movie. Yeah. But that is a, uh, is a film I would definitely recommend. Uh, that people watch to get an idea of the sort of bias that exists in our academic community against this. And it's unfortunate because um, um, universities should be teaching logic, critical thinking, objective analysis, which you and I had just been talking about here. Um, and uh, again, it's that big lie, it's that Kyle Kendrick, uh, candid camera, big lie. People have been taught that this is true uh, by repetition. And so they assume from repetition of the big lie that is true. But when it's exposed to the light of scrutiny, it falls apart like a house of cards. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, we're coming up on the end of our show here. Uh, was there any points that we didn't get to touch on that you, you want to kind of end the show with? No, I, I think we hit the main ones. Uh, I'm going to mention I have a, a couple of, uh, of books mm -hmm. um, uh, out. These, I, these are older books, by the way. This Tornado in the Junkyard came out in 1999. And it uh, thoroughly discusses the, the theory of evolution, what's wrong with it. 
And it goes through a lot of things we didn't have time for today, like dinosaurs. And I have a whole chapter on the Sculpts trial and a uh, famous 1925 evolution trial, uh, which was the subject of a movie called Inherit the Wind. And in the, the book, I compare the trial transcript to the movie script. And you see that the movie 180 degrees opposite of what happened at the trial. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I have a sh much shorter book that you can read uh, probably not much more than an hour. It's called The Case Against Darwin. This book came out in 2002. Uh, so you can see yeah, these are older books. Um, uh, the reason I wrote the shorter book was because people asked me for uh, copies of the longer book, 2800 Junkyard, which is over 300 pages, to give to school boards and stuff. And I said, well, you know, school board members won't have time for a 300-page book. i got to get something short out there. So that's short. Um, those books, uh, you can go to my website, jamesperloff.com, uh, or onto Amazon for those books. But also, you can get this information for free. If you go to my website, jamespulloff.com, and click on the links page, I have a, a set of um, links to creation evolution sites where you can get lots more information for free because this this has been, uh, these issues have been vetted. I just gave you four major examples. There's a whole bunch of, you know, there's individual arguments made by evolutionists that, are, that have been countered and a whole bunch of things we didn't have time to go into today, but I've tried to go over some of the, the fundamental stuff to give people who are uh, still having doubts about creation uh, of a you know, foothold uh, mm -hmm. from where they can they can advance and begin to explore more materials and, and find out more of the truth, uh, because uh, it's very reassuring uh, to know that as a, as a Christian to know that uh, science is actually on our side. You know, yeah. uh, facts are facts. Uh, God's not a liar. Satan is. He's a deceiver from the beginning. And um, this con this intense contradiction we talked about at the beginning between the Bible and what you're being taught in public school. Uh, that needs to be resolved, and people need to take a stand on one side or the other. Yeah, absolutely. It's about understanding that the that the world is created by God, and that the the science that we can observe and that we look at has a place. You know, it's still true, and it has to line up with you know what the Bible says. And and so we have to figure out that balance. And uh, so far, once you do your research into the truth behind a lot of the scientific facts, it all lines up with scripture, which is just reaffirming to uh, many people's belief structures. So I definitely agree with that. Um, and as we close out, I just want to say thank you again for coming on the show. It is always a joy to have you. Oh, it's a joy to come on here. Uh, you're a really intelligent guy and a, a great host. And thanks for giving me uh, a leeway to speak here and asking great questions. And um, uh, you know, I look forward to coming back uh, again when we probably talk about something that has nothing to do with tonight's topic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you are definitely a man of many topics to talk about. So I look forward to that. But that's our show this week, guys. Um, it is about, you know, learning the truth. There is deception in every topic that you're being taught. There is uh, a program that is trying to be forced down your throat, whether it be political, whether it be scientific, there is a purpose behind the lies, there's a purpose behind the way truth is being used. So you have to be able to understand what that is. And in this case, we're talking about Darwinism and just the one, the mathematical improbability that it's just trillion upon trillion upon trillion of odds that it just would never happen. And it's just more probable and realistic and, and facts back it up that there is an intelligent design and there is a creator. And the fact is that he loves you and he wants you and he wants to, to a relationship with you. So uh, I hope that if you maybe came into this as an atheist that you were like, oh, okay, I could kind of see that to talking about logical facts and I could respect that. Um, and if you disagree with what we said, let's talk about it down in the comments below. I'll be happy to um, hear where you're hung up on different things. Like, why why don't you believe that that there is an intelligent creator? Like, what is holding you up? We can have that discussion and maybe both grow from it and learn something new. So that's what we're trying to do here. But you know that I'm not going to ask you to like, subscribe, or share. But, you know, I appreciate it if you do. Hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope that you have a great week. I don't know if you heard about the atheist at the Harvard professor. This atheist was uh, backpacking out in the Massachusetts woods, and he was uh, looking around and uh, admiring all the beauty around him. And he said, look at that waterfall, and look at those beautiful flowers and that sunset. Isn't it amazing what the Big Bang and evolution and pure chance have created? Well, that moment, a big bear raced out from behind some trees, pounced on the atheist, held it down with its paws, and snarled its teeth. And the atheist said, oh, Lord, help me. At that moment, there was a clap of thunder, and a voice from up above said, All these years you've denied that I exist. Is it my understanding that you now wish to become a believer? Well, even though the atheist's life was at stake, this was still too much for his pride to accept. He said, No, I don't want to become a believer, but uh, I'd appreciate it if you made the bear a believer. <laughs>
the voice said, done. And then the bear got on its knees and folded its paws together in prayer and said, Lord, I thank thee for the bounty I am now about to receive. <laughs> The biggest contributor to atheism, uh, I think, in Western civilization was Charles Darwin, and I say that with a little bit of authority because I've written two books about it. Uh, and as you know, uh, Darwin said that men were not made in the image of God, that men had evolved from apes or ape-like creatures. And uh, one thing you may not know, though, is that Darwin tried to do an experiment one day. He put a baboon on a leash, and he took it to one of the poshest restaurants in all of London. And the major d rushed up and he said, Sir, sir, if you can't bring that vile, disgusting beast in here. And Darwin said, My good man, I'll let you know that apes and humans are very close relatives. And the major d said, I was talking to the ape. <laughs>